our first uh, IBS physics colloquium uh, at Te Tejong, which we are running in this um, uh, video mode. And uh, it's a great pleasure also to uh, tell you that we just recently successfully went through our five year uh, reviewing procedures and uh, can now focus on our next three years of research work um, until the next uh, review will hit. Uh, now, uh, uh, as you all know and experienced, uh, there are lots of troubles with uh, doing uh, research uh, and uh, communicating with each other because we are all trapped in our local bubbles somewhere on this uh, planet. And uh, uh, so also practically all uh, meetings which we scheduled for this year at our center had to be canceled and rescheduled. This concerns all the workshops essentially up to still one, which probably will also be shifted, unfortunately. And uh, uh, our advanced study groups, uh, which uh, are, were or are two according to our plans in this year. So in particular, also uh, the advanced study group on deep learning and quantum phase transitions uh, won a number of talks which participants, members of this group uh, agreed to, to give. And in particular, one of them, uh, which will be given uh, today uh, by David Saad, which is uh, uh, part of our colloquium series. Uh, and he will now uh, give an introduction, a more detailed introduction uh, for our uh, speaker. So uh, please, uh, Victor. Oh, Victor, you are on mute currently. Sorry for that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sergey, and thank you, Jazar, for your help. And this is really a pleasure for me to start. And obviously, we are looking forward to come really to the to the Zoom. And uh, this is a, 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 this uh, our uh, advanced study group, uh, which uh, Sergey was talking about, uh, is devoted to the machine learning in quantum phase transitions. And this is uh, so important for us, uh, participation of uh, Professor David Saad from Aspen University, because David spent 30 years of his life in machine learning. He uh, educated in two leading uh, Israeli institutions in Technion and Tel Aviv University. And his education is in physics, in the electrical and electronic engineering. And uh, his PhD thesis uh, was already devoted to the machine learning in neural uh, networks. Uh, after graduating, he moved to Edinburgh uh, in Scotland in uh, 92. And uh, since 95 till today, uh, he is uh, uh, he's, uh, in the Aston University in the United Kingdom uh, in Birmingham. And um, he, for many years, he was head of the Department of Mathematics. He is uh, the lead, uh, leading uh, uh, scientist in his uh, work with the enormous number of uh, works uh, which influenced uh, the machine learning development. And um, he is the, the, the correct person to tell us uh, what is machine learning about and how we can use it in physics, especially because uh, uh, he used methods of statistical physics in developing uh, this uh, machine learning program, which uh, program which brought the new perspective for this uh, study. So, David, please, it's your word. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Victor. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so, this is an overview talk about machine learning, not. Uh, focusing particularly uh, on my work. So a brief outline of my talk, I'm first going to explain what machine learning is. I am going to review recent successes in computer vision, medical applications, and playing games. There are many other applications that have been successful over the years, but I'm just going to mention a few of them. I'm also going to talk about potential pitfalls of uh, machine learning, uh, focus on potentials and risks, and also mention briefly other machine learning approaches. So I'll start my talk with an inequality. 
machine learning is greater than uh, deep neural networks. So a lot of people, when they talk about machine learning, actually nowadays mean driven methods is called machine learning. And a small part of that is deep neural networks, but there, is, there has been a lot of enthusiasm about this particular uh, area uh, in the last, say, 10, 15 years. So what machine learning is and what does it do? So it's a collection of data-driven methods rather than rule-based in order to carry out various applications, various uh, um, 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 problems. So the first one is, would, say, would be regression. So for instance, you have a function that has some parameters like the delay in traffic due to the number of vehicles on the road, and it has some parameters. You can use regression in order to identify the best values for the parameters and what it is that you are getting out of this model. Another one is classification. So for instance, you get uh, uh, images of uh, dogs and cats, uh, which seem to be, uh, according to the number of publications, one of the major problems that uh, humankind faces. So uh, you can identify whether it's a dog or a cat. This is called classification. Dimensionality reduction is when you have uh, lots of data that lives in a high dimensional uh, space, but you would like to reduce it into a relatively small set of parameters. This is also linked to the next item that is called visual informatics. So for instance, the example that is given on, on, on the right is of measurements from an uh, oil pipe. And you would like from the 12 measurements that you have, to find out whether it is in lamina or turbulent flow or a mixed, mixed uh, type of flow. So you can somehow map it onto a two dimensional uh, space that people understand better in order to try to see the different uh, uh, regimes of flow. Uh, machine learning also can do probabilistic modeling to model data, the probability of data do segmentation like in the images on the right where um, a simple uh, image can be um, classified or segmented into different um, uh, components like, a ro like the road, a pedestrian crossing, vehicles, uh, and so on and so on, pavement. Obviously this has a huge importance for uh, self-driving cars, but has many other applications as well. And on top of that, there is optimization and inference inferring the state of variables in a system. One of the reasons for giving this talk is this graph. So this graph represents the probability of mentioning neural networks in articles that uh, uh, talk about machine learning. So as you can see, although it stops in 2010, there is a huge increase in the probability of, of finding neural networks in machine learning articles. And I assume, I haven't checked it, but I assume that this is going uh, even higher as we go beyond 2015. And um, I would like to put things in context. So uh, machine learning is a huge area. Uh, this is a graph that was taken from, from uh, the book of my ex-PhD student, David Barber, on uh, Bayesian reasoning and machine learning. And he describes the field of machine learning, and it has two main lobes. One lobe is called supervisor learning, supervised learning. So in supervised learning, you are trying to, to learn some sort of a uh, function. You have an input, and you are trying to, uh, to uh, match the corresponding output. So that you're being given data, like for instance, images of dogs and cats and the classification, dog, cat, dog, cat, and so on. And what you're trying to do is to establish uh, the underlying function so that when you have a new data point, you will be able to classify it correctly. So in this very uh, elaborate tree, um, deep learning machines is just one tiny leaf of a non-linear semi-parametric regression or classification tasks. I can, it's uh, even difficult to spot it on, on, on this um, lobe of um, supervised learning. 
The second law is called unsupervised learning. In this case, you simply have a lot of data. You get data and you're trying to find what is the probability distribution of data. As an example, if you were to get um, um, images of handwritten digits without labeling them, you would expect them to cluster around 10 specific prototypical examples of digits. The probability distribution of all of this um, data is what you are after in unsupervised learning. So I mentioned already that deep learning has been extremely successful. Um, I think that it rev revolutionized computer vision, but has made significant contributions in speech recognition, in playing games like Go, Atari, I'm going to talk about that uh, later, in speech understanding, lip reading, composing music and artwork, having seen enough uh, uh, um, uh, images of uh, pictures of Van Gogh, you can take a picture and um, transform it to a Van Gogh style picture, similarly with composing music. It um, made a huge impact on drug and molecule design, and also in physics, in analyzing particle accelerator data. And there is another dubious achievement, which is the generation of fake videos. Um, so in computer vision, just in order to explain what, how it revolutionized the field, there is a data, database that is called ImageNet, which includes about 1 million different images uh, of uh, 1,000 categories. And they introduced a challenge. So this is a typical example of how images look in, in DataNet, uh, ImageNet. And the challenge was to classify correctly a subset, randomly selected subset of these images. So when it was introduced in 2010, um, you can see on the vertical um, uh, axis, uh, the performance of different groups. And none of the groups managed to reduce the error below the 25% mark. In 2012, that was the year in which the first deep learning machine was used in, in, in this particular challenge. And you can see that they managed to get the first ones to, to get below the 25% mark. Uh, more groups learned the trick and they've used deep learning machine. And if you go, go on to 2017, you can see that 29 out of the 38 teams managed to get more than uh, less than 5% uh, uh, wrong classification. So this is a huge achievement by using this uh, new method of a deep, deep learning machine that I'm going to talk about later. So where is that important? For instance, if we are talking about self-driving cars, segmentation, being able to identify the, um, 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 the objects around you is extremely important. You have to identify whether it's a pedestrian, whether it's a, a road, pedestrian crossing, whatever in order to um, drive safely. This is an obvious application. There have also been a lot of medically related applications. So in this particular case, it's uh, uh, trying to look at benign and uh, uh, malignant uh, lesions. Um, so this particular deep, deep neural network was pre-trained on 1.4 million images from ImageNet and then specifically on 130,000 clin clinical images. And it is believed now to perform uh, as good as, as um, clinical experts on identifying malignant uh, lesions from images. Um, another quite um, impressive example is trying to um, identify breast cancer from uh, mammographic images. So this is a huge data set of about 1 million images and the network has been trained to identify um, a malignant um, growth. And what is impressive is the image on the right where you can see that individual radiologists will be able to recognize about 
77.8% of, um, of, um, of the growth is uh, malignant, while the deep neural networks will do um, about 87.6%, it will get 87.6% right. Um, slice slightly worse than a team of 14 radiologists looking at the same pictures. So I think this is quite impressive uh, for a machine. Many other successes in the area of uh, uh, computer vision, like for instance, improving lung cancer prognosis. Uh, I mean, there are so many different examples and I'm not going to go over them, but of course I could not avoid um, mentioning COVID-19 that keeps us uh, in our homes for, for quite a long time. There have been several attempts to, um, to forecast, to, to look at the patient prognosis from CT images, but I would say that there are mixed successes and not all of, the, not all of these applications work very well. Um, another very well-known example is um, AlphaGo that managed to beat Lee Sedol in 2016 in Go. So Go is perceived to be a very sophisticated and, and um, demanding application. And uh, Lee Sedol, um, from Korea, of course, was uh, 18 times world champion. And yet um, AlphaGo managed to beat him in, in Go, which is a huge achievement. Other successes in the area of games is um, Spacecraft 2 um, Alpha Star became got a master of some, some very high level in, in Spacecraft 2 and in uh, playing poker where they managed to beat uh, human participants. The next example is an old computer game, Atari computer game, which I think probably some of you remember. So um, the challenge here is is for a vertical bar at the bottom to hit a ball or a point. And each time the point hits one of the bricks at the top, it simply destroys them. So at the beginning, the machine moves, the deep learning machine moves the bar relatively clumsily. Sometimes it misses, sometimes it doesn't, but it improves with time. After 400 tra training episodes, it's not too bad it manages to demolish the wall fairly effectively. But what happens next is truly amazing because somehow after 600 uh, training episodes, it realizes, I mean, the machine realizes that by going through the wall, it demolishes uh, the bricks much more effectively. And I think this is truly amazing. And there are no rules. I mean, it simply learns it on its own by doing many, many different trials. So all is going to plan, or is it? So not quite, because in order to use deep learning machines, we need huge data sets of labeled data. This is very expensive if you think about a radiologist sitting in front of computer screens and labeling data for, for um, hundreds and thousands of, of, of images. We need enormous computing, computing power. There is a paper, a recent paper from 2019 that says that between 2012 and 2018, the amount of computing power that went into machine learning has grown by 300,000 fold. And also energy. What we use in order to train deep learning machines are training methods that are poorly understood with lots of heuristics in order to make them work. We also use, whether we admit it or not, a lot of engineering insight in order to construct the deep learning machines and uh, to use them effectively. What we do not have is a clear understanding when the machine is going to fail an explanation for the decisions and an interpretation of the results. 
um, we don't have any methods to transfer knowledge effectively between applications. So um, learning a lot about a specific application doesn't help us to learn much about an, another one. And there is no intelligence, reasoning, or consciousness in, in, in these machines. I'm going to show you a few failures of deep learning networks, or at least artificial intelligence. So for instance, Google AI identifies these um, plastic uh, turtle models, some of them at least, as rifles for some reason. Nobody quite knows why. The British Metropolitan Police, in uh, its fight against pedophilia, uh, trained um, a machine to remove all images of nudity. Unfortunately, it also removed all images of deserts, probably because it, it looks like skin color and the curvature matches it all. Now, to be honest, I don't know whether these applications are based on deep neural networks or not, because there, is no, um, there are no details, but it has all the hallmarks of uh, machine learning approaches. Um, Another example for a failure is the identification of pandas. So this is an example that was introduced by Goodfellow in 2015. Um, so this image of panda is identified with 57% confidence, which is absolutely fine, except for the fact that this image of a panda is being identified as a gibbon in 99.3% uh, with 99.3% confidence. And the difference between the two images is a slight change uh, in, in the picture, imperceptible change in the picture. So if each one of the pixels is, is of strength order one, the noise that has been added is 0 0.007 multiplied by some um, value. So with this, um, well-chosen noise, we have identified a panda as a gibbon. And this gave rise to a whole uh, field that is called generative adversarial learning, whereby people identify these weaknesses and try to fix them by introducing examples that will uh, get rid of this sensitivity. Another example is identifying bananas. So when you have a, put a banana on a, on a table and you take a picture and you correctly identify it with almost 100% accuracy as a banana, that's the picture on the top. But then when you add a sticker, um, for some reason, it identifies it as a toaster with almost 100% confidence. Now you can imagine that this can be a big problem if you identify traffic signs incorrectly because someone put a sticker deliberately or not on a traffic sign, then you may end up um, uh, running into a junction without stopping or something uh, disastrous, similarly disastrous. Another example of the same type, so um, a machine has uh, been trained to identify an actress, uh, Kaylee de Fer, with almost probability one, but with perturbing frames of the right type, it identifies it as Nancy Travis. So again, these are very well chosen uh, perturbations, but it shows the sensitivity and difficulty in um, in uh, managing with um, different situations because we know that these perturbing frames do not change the classification, this one actress to the other, but the machine doesn't. Finally, um, an example about identifying cats. So this uh, picture of uh, a cat is identified correctly with more than 80% certainty as a tabby cat. But when you tilt it, suddenly it is being identified as guacamole. So obviously there are issues to be solved and there is a lot of activity in this community in trying to address um, these issues. 
So I'm talking all the time about deep learning machines, about neural networks. What is the relation between these artificial neural networks and the real neural networks? So a real neuron has um, the cell body, the soma, which is uh, at the center of the, of, the, of the neuron. It has an axon, which is more or less the output, the firing, it, it, it trans, transmits the firing of the neuron to other cells. And there is what is called a dendritic, dendritic tree with synapses that is connected to other neurons that feed this particular neuron. Now, all of this picture is extremely uh, simplistic because there are many different types of neurons. There are um, different synaptic time delays in the axons. In, it's, it's a much more complex uh, structure than uh, what, what I'm describing here. But if you take one neuron and you connect many of them, and in this case, the picture on the right describes pyramidal cells, which are excitatory neurons. They are also inhibitory neurons. They are connected fairly densely to one another in the gray matter and also are connected, groups are connected through the white matter, which is the uh, subtract be, uh, below the gray matter. But the brain itself has also different parts each one of them has different functionality uh, and operates um, slightly differently. So these are real neurons. I'm not an expert in, in real neural networks, but this is a, generally the, the picture. So what do real neurons have with artificial neurons? So the si simplest possible structure is what is called a perceptron. And the perceptron is based on the fact that you have inputs, like the inputs to the neuron from other neurons. Each one of them is weighed by a certain parameter, wi for, for xi. And the firing or the output of the neuron that is transmitted to other neurons is some function, y is a function of w and x. So it can be a dot product between x and w that you're uh, using. And the output can be either discrete or, or, or continuous, whatever you want to choose. So going back to 58, Frank Rosenblatt introduced the perceptron, practically what I showed you before, but in a, with discrete outputs. And this is an article from the New York Times in uh, uh, the 8th of July, 58. And it says that the Navy reveals an electronic computer that will walk, talk, see, write, repro reproduce itself, and be conscious of uh, its existence. Um, not quite, I would say. Um, what can perceptrons do? So um, one of the applications that I can um, mention is again, uh, and identifying handwritten digits. So if you sample all of these digits as um, at the bottom image, and you present them as zeros and ones, you'll have a picture like the one in the middle. And if you train, if you try to evaluate the best parameters, W, I, for identifying each one of the figures, you will be able to have a, a machine like the one on the right, where you have inputs represented by the images, weighed by the different weights, and you can classify them as um, uh, any of the digits, uh, one, two, three, four, until uh, 10. Um, but then people have discovered that the perception actually is very limited. It can do very few things. Uh, it's a very um, small fraction of the possible functions that one can actually uh, represent, and it was abundant. Just in order to describe the history of artificial neural networks or neural networks in time, uh, I wanted to show you how um, this field has progressed. So I think that it is perceived that the first representation, mathematical representation of a neuron was suggested in 43 by McCulloch and Pitts, it's a semi-linear representation of the neuron. And in 49, Donald Hebb introduced what is called the training, Hebb training rule. 
app training rule is very simple. It says that if two elements, two neurons are firing simultaneously, then the connection between them is increasing. And on the contrary, if they don't, it is decreasing. Um, in 58, Rosenblatt uh, introduced his perceptron that I mentioned before, but this was abundant in 69, where people, there, there was a book called Perceptrons that described all the limitations of, of the perceptrons. The next phase in neural networks came in the 80s, when in 82, uh, John Hopfield introduced a, an associative memory model that could be also analyzed as a physical system. Uh, but then people moved on to layered machines and um, a training rule by the name of belief propagation was introduced in 1986. Actually, it's not exactly 86 because it was this, um, um, identified before in other contexts uh, and it's simple gradient descent. But I would say that 86 is probably the time people um, attribute to the identification of belief propagation. In 2006, there was the introduction of deep learning machines, which is like multi-layered neural networks, but with many, many layers. And it has been applied to many different applications and became a big success. So back to multi-layer perceptrons. So this uh, a picture is from a, an article in 1989 of a multi-layer perceptron being trained to classify handwritten digits. So you have the handwritten digit at the bottom with 256 input units, and it is being sampled. There, there is a window that is being sampled of five by five pixels. And um, this window, is sampled and identifies features that are being fed into the next layer. And the combination of features is being fed to the next layer. And eventually in the final layer, you have only 10 output units that through the combination of the different features together, uh, enable you to identify handwritten digits. So this particular application had the success rate of about 96 percent, which looks quite impressive. Uh, it was tested on something that is called the MNIST database with 70,000 images of handwritten digits. And the test set included 10,000 images. Increasing the number of layers and using deep learning machines, the success rate has gone up to an impressive 99.8 uh, uh, successful um, classifications. And if you see examples of the uh, handwritten digits that have not been classified correctly, I don't think that I would be able to classify them as well. So how does it happen? So on the face of it, what we do is we simply take a layered machine with many, many different layers, and we feed an input, and we know what the output should be like, like classifying an image, like retrieving an image, like reconstructing an image, whatever. And through a process of that is basically a glorified uh, um, uh, gradient descent, we modify the weights between layers. What emerges in the hidden layers, the internal representations, are features like edges in the second layer, like combinations of edges that give you a more elaborate pictures, more elaborate parts of pictures like eyes, like noses, like uh, uh, mouths and so on. And the combination of those that give you a whole, uh, a model of the whole object. So this is in theory. Um, so what really has changed that made multi-layered machines so powerful if you increase the number of layers? So the first one is data. People who worked in the uh, 90s and in the 80s struggled to get, to get data. Nowadays, we have an abundance of data. We have del deluge of data from social networks, from CCTV cameras, from monitors, from, I mean, there are databases of anything you can think of. 
The second thing is, uh, and by the way, and this data is very important because you need a lot of data in order to train many, many parameters. Secondly, is computing power. So as I mentioned before, just between 2012 and 2018, the amount of computing power that went into machine learning grew by 300,000. The other big step was multi-layer deep learning machines. Um, and also, I think this is underestimated, but I think the ready to use software packages that um, uh, exist nowadays make it so much easier for many more people to experiment with uh, um, deep learning machines that you effectively increase the community and the tests that are being done on, on deep learning machines significantly. There were also minor improvement in training and architecture that contributed to, to this success. So one of the appealing aspects in um, deep learning machines is that you roughly understand how it works. You have a three layer system, you add more layers and suddenly it works much better. However, if you really look at the record breaking machines like the VGG convolutional network for classification, you can see that a lot of engineering insight and understanding went into the design of this machine. It's not just a random sequence of layers, it's very well crafted in order to provide a specific output. Okay, is deeper better? It is not clear. It is not clear how deep and it is not clear what is the uh, ratio of improvement. People became a bit more bold saying that maybe machine learning should replace science because at the end of the day, what is science? Natural sciences. We have data, we hypothesize, we model, we test, and we come up with scientific rules. Scientific rules then give rise to data because we are trying to use scientific rules for prediction, for, for understanding, for getting, having a concept about new situations. So these people's, people argue, why not bypass the scientific rules? So if we can learn from data, apply it as a predictive model to produce data, why do we need the scientific rules? For instance, if instead of Newton um, sitting under the tree watching apples falling, if we were to take many different images of apples falling and feed it into a neural networks, and eventually we will be able to say exactly or with relatively good accuracy, what is the position of an apple at any given time, a falling apple? So the argument is that correlation between events supersedes causation. And science can simply bypass all of these rules and, and unify theories and everything that we have, we have been trying to achieve for a long time and replace them by machine learning. Um, I don't think so personally, because I think that scientific formulation is much, much more than that. It, is, it gives us a compact representation of reality. It reflects some understanding because we as humans, we cannot understand a um, um, deluge of data. We understand reduced representations that gives us some meaning to, the, to, 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 to this uh, behavior and natural behavior that we are trying to model. We also hope, at least I do, that it represents some model of a grand truth that exists, the underlying grand truth that we are trying to discover. And most importantly, it is transformative and universal. The same rules apply to apples as well as to galaxies. So um, we don't have to learn many different objects, many different rules, uh, we have a compact representation of this rule. So what is the link between artificial and natural intelligence? So in, nat in artificial intelligence, there is no reasoning, there is no consciousness, there is no representation of the world, no attention, no causality. There are huge data sets that are needed compared to humans. For instance, a, a 
uh, a baby doesn't need to see 100,000 images of dogs in order to identify a dog. There is no ability trans to transfer knowledge or combine it with additional information. So it may be something completely different, but is it a good thing? So Elon Musk, for instance, um, is um, alerting us all to the invasion of AI into our life and um, advocates stronger regulation in order to make sure that it doesn't harm society. Stephen Hawking was, uh, went even further. He said that he's uh, worried that uh, artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. So there are serious concerns about the role of AI in machine learning, but let's try to evaluate it in a more balanced way and look at the potential and risks. So the potential, we could have socializing uh, robots like Sophia, uh, we can maybe get someone to help us solve our deep and difficult mathematical problems or invest our money in the stock market. All of these applications can happen, may happen, will happen. So there is a lot of, there are a lot of tasks that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can do probably better than us or save our time, like uh, care provision, like uh, drive our cars, fly our planes, search document, harvest data effectively, find new drugs for uh, evolving epidemics, pandemics, use resources more effectively, um, smart agriculture, identify um, um, data from physics, many different applications that it can do quite well. But what are the risks? So a lot of people are thinking about the risks as evil robots that will take over the world or AI that will start reproducing itself and will get rid of the human race or that computers will run our life as they already do to some extent. But there are also societal risks. So this is a book that was written in 52 by Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut called Play a Piano. And he describes a society where there is a a very small fraction of society that does interesting things is the scientists and the engineers. And all of the others are um, employed by the state simply because there are not enough interesting jobs. So this is a paragraph from the book. And um, um, there is, um, in this book, there is a, a computer. And in the terms of 1952, it's a big machine with a lot of blinking lights called uh, Epicac. And each day it prints out a list of human professions and machine professions. And each day this list is becoming shorter and shorter. I mean, the uh, machine professions are becoming, uh, occupying a big part of this list. So for instance, uh, in this paragraph, they talk about the third industrial revolution. So the first one was muscle work, then there was a routine work, and then maybe the real brain work. And any man who cannot support himself by doing a job better than a machine is employed by the government, either in the army or reconstruction and reclamation corps. So I read this book in 91. And to my surprise, in 2013, I came across a, a study by a group in Oxford that looked at the future of employment. And they tried to predict the probability that a job uh, will still be, be a human job in 10 years time. So there is a list of 700 uh, professions. So if you are a recre recreational therapist, probably your job is pretty secure. There is only a probability of 0.3% that you will lose it. But if you are a watch repair or a text repair, maybe you should look for another career. So this reminded me very much of the um, computer of uh, Kurt Vonnegut. What are the additional risks? So um, instabilities and accountability. So machine learning methods will control financial markets, utility networks, health related decisions and autonomous agents. And um, this is another book by Robert Harris that is called The Fear Index, a more recent book, where a computer is driving the financial market to, a brink, to the brink because it wants to maximize profit. 
So we should be very careful about giving machines the, by the way, I did not get any commission from any of these books, any of these authors. Um, but we have to be very careful about uh, using machine learning um, and putting the right limits um, in order to avoid disasters. Because in unexpected situations, uh, we may unexpected situation may lead to global instabilities. And if we have autonomous agents of any type, they may behave not as expected, and who is responsible. So how should we proceed? Probably cautiously. There is a strong need for machine learning ethics, smart limits on autonomy regulation, and there should be a focus on explainability and inter interpretability. You don't want to go to your physician who will say you have to undergo a specific uh, procedure because the computer said so. You have to be able to explain it in some way. And consider carefully the societal impacts. Now, I mentioned that there are many other machine learning methods. And actually, I'm not going to talk about them now, today. But I'm going to give a talk in two days' time. And I'm going to go over. Uh, th th this talk is going to focus on other machine learning methods, not on deep learning machines. I'm going to review some of these approaches. So finally. I think it is clear that machine learning is here and will help us solve specific problems that are well posed and well defined. Some of them are classified as human professions in the Kurt Vonnegut uh, term of the world of the world. Societal risks and misuse should be taken seriously, and we have to mitigate them through regulation and ethical supervision. We have to put focus on explainability and inter interpretability of the machine learning results in order to make them more acceptable by humans. And we hope that there are still significant gaps between machine and human intelligence. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Very okay. I suggest that uh, people can ask questions right now and uh, i enjoyed your talk and once again i'm also not uh, getting any uh, commission from the books but i it looks like i was preparing for a talk i finished uh, a book by the israeli professor of physics yuval noah harari and he is now a very famous writer and uh, not this one this is homo sapiens another one is uh, called homo deus yeah, yeah, I know. I, I've read them. And it mentions the exactly starting from this famous South Korean Go player who was beaten by the machine. And it talks about the uh, dangers you were talking right now and about possibilities that people will be losing their jobs. So well, it's very interesting related. Okay, please, questions. Well, let me maybe just uh, start. Uh... And uh, first of all, thank David for this fantastic uh, colloquium talk. Very interesting, very impressive. And I also want to add a slight comment on the commissions. I, I would be I would be surprised uh, if you got a, a commission from and happy if you got a commission from Kurt Vonnegut, who unfortunately I think is not there <laughs> yeah. for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah. Right. So uh, th there's there's one thing I, I like very much this these examples where you. Uh, showed that slight uh, changes in uh, some of the perhaps training data or the test data can uh, completely irritate uh, the well-trained machine. Uh, wh what is the reason for that? Is there some mathematical reason which is some kind of pseudo-degeneracy of some uh, functions with many minima or uh, can you give some feeling what, what is going on? Yeah. So um, if you think about it in the high dimensional space where all of these um, images, for instance, sit, there is a very convoluted, can be a very convoluted separating line between say two classes. And um, um, if you identify the right direction in the multi-dimensional space where you can pass this line quite easily, then uh, you impose that on the picture and, and you simply do that. 
um, when, you, when you learn examples, you learn from a subset of examples. And this gives you, it's a, always a suboptimal solution that um, sort of represents the, uh, builds up this uh, high dimensional separating hyperplane between groups. And it's, it's very difficult to control with any finite number of, of uh, examples. So for instance, what these people do um, in a generative adversarial, adversarial learning is to identify the sensitive areas and try to blur them by generating examples that will exactly teach the machine to avoid these um, convoluted um, um, separating hyperplanes. I see. So uh, that is uh, that probably tells again that uh, we, uh, our brains are construct are somehow operating quite differently because I guess that uh, uh, we will be much less uh, vulnerable to some uh, small, small enough, so to say, uh, noise uh, in, in in the input yeah. data which we receive, right? Yeah, um, I I think that artificial neural networks my personal view have very little to do with real neural networks uh, it's just a machine that works very well but that's my own opinion okay thank you uh let me just oh. go on here i think sarika has a question sarika just unmute yourself yes. please. yeah okay thank you it was very nice talk so i have just one question like what major revolution you think that machine learning can bring and uh, what uh, challenges uh, it has to bring that revolution, for example. If you can comment something on that. Okay, so, so this is a big question. Uh, the third revolution, right? Um, so I think my, my opinion and uh, predictions are, can always be horribly wrong, is that um, artificial neural networks or machine learning will simply help us continue to help us do many different tasks more efficiently. I think it is uh, very important to work on the machine human connection. So explainability and interpretability is one cornerstone of, of this operation because the machine can tell us. So for instance, I, I gave this example before, you go to a doctor and he says, well, I think you have to go undergo a certain procedure, like, I don't know, remove a kidney. And uh, he says, well, you know, the machine said, said so. Look, it's 5.7, it's written here. I don't think that it will convince a lot of patients to undergo this procedure. But if you will be able to say um, that um, there is a combination of an, an explainable and interpretable combination of, um, of um, health problems that will, so that it will be beneficial for you to undergo this procedure, then maybe you will be, um, you will accept it. So I think that it is very important for us to, in order to benefit fully from machine learning in the broad sense, is to be able to understand what it tells us and not as an opaque machine. But uh, I, I don't think that, I mean, again, I may be completely wrong, but uh, I don't think that there is, it will contribute in terms of intelligence. It will contribute in terms of doing a lot of tasks much better. Yeah, thank you. Um, David, I have a quick question. So, yep. um, you, when you were mentioning these examples where things went wrong, right? For the cat turning into guacamole, so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the way I understand it is somehow there's a lot of data which, which goes into the machine learning these uh, recognizability patterns. But as you were saying, the, the human mind works differently, right? I mean, we, we sort of blur out things. Yeah. We coarse grain them a lot. So, yes. um, is there any way that a machine can also be made to coarse grain things more and, and remove these sensitivity areas as, as you were mentioning, but yeah. how much to coarse grain and how to do this? Could, could you comment yeah. on this please? Yeah, so, so you're absolutely right. And uh, all of the computer vision methods pre uh, deep learning machines uh, really tried to use coarse graining, to use a lot of um, 
approaches in order to reduce the complexity of images and try to take advantage of some rules that we know. In deep learning machine, this is being done implicitly by, um, by the introduction of information reducing uh, what is called activation functions or neurons. So some of them are reducing information. And there are all sorts of tricks like pooling in which you are taking a, a subset of the neurons together and you make one out of, it's like coarse graining. But this is again, it requires engineering insight. It is not coming automatically. Uh, I am very hesitant to compare anything to the human brain, but I believe that, as you said, what we are doing is automatically to reduce the complexity of, of the information. I mean, it's not that uh, overcapacity can be very dangerous. So can you can imagine a person who um, identifies there, there is a snake and a, there is a, um, he's bitten by a snake and the next day there is a, another snake, but it's not identical to the first one, right? In order to identify it as a snake and beware of it, it has to, uh, to create an abstract image of the snake. So some cylindrical animal that is moving in a wiggly way. So there is a reduction of the information that we perceive, that, that we receive in order to do the generalization, to carry a successful generalization. I think that this is not done automatically in a deep learning machine without reducing information, putting engineering insight in, into it and so on. Right. So I don't know if I answered your question, but um, yeah, no, I, I think that that was uh, yeah something that I was wondering about if there are anything uh, any steps in these directions. So yeah, uh, but thank you. Uh, um, I see Ihar said uh, raise questions, so please Ihar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask, you mentioned uh, that uh, recently deep neural networks are becoming uh, larger and larger. So are there good reasons for this? Is it just because it's a very cheap scalability in the modern world of a lot of computational resources and like uh, for other uh, machine learning uh, models and methods or why is it so far this thing? Um, so the argument is that deeper learning machines are um, are working better, but I don't know if this is supported by, by clear scientific reasoning. I, I'm not convinced that it does. Um, but the folklore is saying that uh, deeper neural networks work better, deeper neural networks will, will require more parameter, more variability in the different layers, more training, more examples, and everything is ballooning and there is a risk there because, I mean, the people who will be able to do, um, uh, to carry out very complex uh, machine learning tasks are the companies that have huge computing resources and huge amounts of data. So it will effectively create inequality, great inequality between um, me and, and you and others who are working on the home computers and the big companies who will be able to um, complicate the tasks. Uh, I don't think that there is a clear understanding that deeper machines with more parameters will work better. At least I'm not aware of. See, thank you. So I think there are, Nana had a question. Nana, please unmute and ask. Okay. Hi, uh, David. Excuse me that uh, yeah, in your talk uh, that you said that uh, uh, machine learning can distinguish two different kinds of uh, uh, cat and dog. I mean, you can distinguish cats and dogs. There are two kind, uh, two different kinds of animals, right? So yeah. uh, what will happen if uh, uh, a situation comes to just one animal? I mean, like uh, uh, cats, cat, just well, cats. You know, it can identify different types of specific types of cats and specific types of dogs. It can even do um, um, computer vision at a much, much uh, deeper level, like uh, classifying a dog, a 
certain type of dog, uh, a Dalmatian, say, catching a tennis ball. Okay, thanks. So uh, what will happen, I mean, uh, when the tw like two dogs, uh, they are twins, yeah. it can distinguish or not? It also can distinguish? Oh, that's a difficult one. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I have another, so uh, like a confidence, confidence and a smile, like this kind of stuff is uh, uh, subjective, right? So how can machine learning distinguish them? How, uh, uh, I mean, how can it distinguish uh, uh, which, uh, I mean, how many percentage this smile or confidence, I mean? So I, I'm not sure that I got the question. Can you repeat that? So uh, the, like a confidence and a smile, this are uh, uh, subjective stuff, subjective. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so how can machine learning distinguish uh, how many percentage they are? Um, so I, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a oh, very sorry. detailed question. And uh, I, mm -hmm. um, so what the argument is that wherever you have a distinction, let's say, between a number of classes, you can also get a confidence level about okay. your, your prediction. You can say, okay, this is, with a certain percentage, I'm confident that this is A or this is B. Um, okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, Nana, unmute yourself, please. Uh, and I okay. think there's Alexei Andrianov. Alexei, please uh, unmute and ask. Yeah, okay. Hey, David, thanks for the um, nice talk. I have several questions that are more technical. So one, you mentioned belief propagation uh, somewhere yes. in the first slide. Yeah. Is it in any yeah. way related to uh, this, uh, to say the gradient descent method that everyone is using or? It is exactly the same. Uh, I mean, it is gradient descent. Um, the difference between belief propagation is that um, um, gradient descent is, is a bit more general. Belief propagation is, relies on the fact that you can use information about changes in a previous layer in order to make the changes in the next layer. But it is exactly the same. It is uh, just um, the terminology is such that belief propagation is more economical has lower complexity because you can use information about the previous corrections in the previous layer instead of calculating it again. Um, but it is the same. Okay, yeah, and so the other thing is actually related to this uh, examples where the networks were fooled yeah. to give the incorrect answer. Uh, yeah. Am I correct understanding that this basically corresponds to the fact uh, that once you train your network, you basically land, if you think of the network as a function with a lot of parameters. Yes. You you do the training, you land in one of the local minima. Correct. And now that local minima uh, happens to have uh, zero modes, that is flight directions that probably connected to other minima, and that's precisely the modifications people did. So push it along that direction. Uh, that is correct. That is okay, correct. so then my... Third question is actually uh, precisely about how these things work. So uh, my experience from studying glasses tells me that with this, given the complexity of the function, if you do the stochastic, sorry, the gradient uh, descent optimization, you would yeah. land up in one of the local minima. Right. So my question is, I mean, for instance, is it known like how many such flat directions a typical minim minimum has and what is known about the landscape? So, I mean, uh, imagine you take, uh, again, you try to distinguish cats and dogs and you train yeah. the network several times. Yeah. You would probably land in different minima. Yeah. Would they all have similar properties or uh, would there be changes? Okay, and that's a very good question because, um, uh, but, but the answer is very complex because we are not talking about a well-defined rule. So if you look at the Ising model or Sherrington Kirkpatrick model or something like that, then you know exactly the distribution probability of different weights and you look at an ensemble that you sampled um, at random from this distribution. Here you have, you don't know the rules and the interaction between elements. 
So the energy landscape is much less well-defined. So um, um, uh, what you are asking, and this is a, an important and interesting research area, is what is the stability of your solutions against perturbations in data set? And one may argue that it, the best thing to do is to have solutions in flat regions that are fairly stable against perturbations in the data set. Uh, but this is another research area. People are actively uh, pursuing this research area on trying to find, to have training rules that bias you towards more stable minima. Have I answered your question or? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Except, I mean, just one comment. I would somehow presume, uh, can one not argue that if your data set is huge, well, potentially, of course, one could think of an infinite one, you would get something like, um, well, I'm not sure if it's correct to call it self-averaging, but yeah, perhaps if, if the data set, if the training data set is huge enough, yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't the result not so much depend on the data set itself? But remember that also the number of variables is huge. So um, if you were, so if you have n variables and you have exponentially many examples, then you are fine. Or I don't know, even quadratically or cubically. But uh, normally you have many, many different variables in a non-linear recursive function. And the number of examples is not exponential. It usually scales linearly or at most quadratically with the number of variables. Yeah, okay, thank you. So self-averaging is probably uh, pushing it too far. Yes. Okay, any other questions, please? Any other participants, please? Okay, then I think uh, we have to thank uh, David again for an amazing talk. And I'll remind you that in two days we will have a talk and additional talk by David, uh, should I say more related to the quantum phase transitions or more to the technical stuff, David? What, is, what should I say? No, no, it's going to be about machine learning methods, other machine learning methods than deep learning machine, uh, more principled and probabilistic ones. Okay, great. Thank you. I wanted to thank everyone who is participating and uh, not in particular, but the, it's great that all members of uh, advanced study group uh, have taken part and thank you very much. So, Juzar, please do your job. <laughs>Thank you, David. Thank you all. Thank you. So let's stop share. Okay. Uh